Hi there, thank you for joining me in the galleries today. We are in the exhibit called Obukle Women, Beadwork and the Art of Independence. We really hope that you get the chance to see this beautiful exhibit. Each piece is made from beads that are strung onto fabric to make these exquisite artworks. These are made by women in South Africa. And today we're gonna to be reading a story in front of this piece. It's called Hope. And if you look real close, you can see there are two structures. Here, they both look similar. They look like um, domed buildings. We have a structure here with a little white domed door and then a big dome ceiling. And then over here, we have another structure and it also looks similar, but it's a little bit at an angle. And we have a walkway that links the two structures together. And then the artist also spent a lot of time creating the sky. We have several stars and white shapes that make up clouds. We have the sun and the moon. This is a beautiful piece. And again, it's called Hope. And we're gonna read a story in front of it today. The book that we're gonna be reading today is The Village of Round and Square Houses by Anne Griploconi. This book takes place in West Africa. And these beadwork pieces in this exhibit are actually from South Africa, but we see some of the similar shapes of the houses that are in the book are almost mimic, also mimicked here in the beadwork. And so um, they have some similarities and this book takes place a long time ago and there's part of it that talks about um, the sky and how important the sky and the environment was to this village. And so that's why I chose this book to go along with this work of art. The Village of Round and Square Houses by Anne Griffel Coney. This village really exists, just the way it always has in the remote hills of the Cameroons in Central Africa. It is almost entirely isolated, with no paved roads closer to it than a full eight hours away. None but the most adventurous visitor would dare to risk the steep and bumpy, rocky clay paths leading to the thatch-roofed village that clings to the side of an almost extinct volcano. Today, the village of Taos remains. I know, for I have been there. The homesick girl who brought us there told us its story. It was not until I was almost full grown and left my village that I found our village was like no other. For the men live in square houses and the women in round ones. To me, this seemed the natural order of things. But what is it like, you ask? I will tell you how it was and is for me. I grew up on my grandmother's farm in the village of Taos. That lies at the foot of Naka Mountain in the Bahimi Hills of West Africa. We planted yams and corn and tobacco and the finest coffee grown in the Cameroons. Our village was always happy and peaceful, a good place for any boy or girl to grow up. Every evening, after a day of work in the fields, Uncle Domo and Grandpa Oma came to our round house for supper. We children would hurry to put out the low wooden stool for Grandpa Oma, for he was the eldest and closer to the ancestor spirits. Then we would unroll the grass mat for Uncle Domo, the next oldest, as was only proper and respectful. And there they would sit, proudly in their bright robes, Grandpa Oma above, seated on his stool, hands on knees, and Uncle Domo seated below. Then they would ask to see the children. One by one, we would come forward from the narrow doorway, and one by one, we would be lifted to sit upon those high and bony knees, and Grandpa would ask each one of us, what have you learned today? We would squirm and make an answer and wiggle off those sharp knees and run to help Mama and Grandma Tika prepare the meal to come. Supper might be fish, or rabbit, or ground nut stew, or yams. 
but always I would be the one to pound and soften the white cassava root to make the foo-foo we eat at every meal. Then Mama would cook the foo-foo and beat it till it was white and fluffy, and she would pile the food into big bowls with round handles, just right for our small hands to hold. Then we would march into the big round room, our bare feet gripping the earthen floor. The little ones went first, carrying the bowl of heated water and towels to wash the hands before eating and after eating. Then the older ones would carry in the stew, spicy and steaming, smelling oh so good. And I would come in last, bearing the foo-foo. Grandpa, as the eldest, would always eat first, dipping the first three fingers of one hand into the foo-foo, scooping up a small portion, which he dipped quickly into the stew bowl to flavor each bite with the spicy meat and juices. Then, in order of age, Grandma, Uncle Domo, and sometimes Mama, if she left the cook fire, would finish their meal in the same way. And we children would follow last, making sure to leave the bowl clean. After supper, when the men went back to their square house to smoke and talk of farming and fishing and the old days of the hunt, Grandpa would leave some tobacco for Grandma. He knew she liked to smoke it later, when everything was peaceful. Then she would sit alone in the moonlight, looking up at the dark slope of Naka Mountain, rising high above. I remember one night I sat beside her. Grandma Tika took a last puff on her pipe, then pointed with it to the sky above our village. You see old mother Naka smoking so peacefully there? I leaned way back and looked up to see old Naka's breath rising in lazy puffs of smoke, soft and gray in the night sky. And you remember that sometimes in the night we hear old Naka snoring in her sleep? I nodded, pleased that Grandma felt I was old enough to notice such things. Well, it is by these signs that we know she is content. Now we live in peace with Naka and the spirits of our ancestors, but it was not always so. Grandma fixed me with a stare and began to rock with the tail, for she was the best storyteller in the whole village. In the days of long, long ago, the people of this village lived in houses of any sort, either square or round. It did not matter. Then, one peaceful night before anyone alive remembers, old Naka began to groan and rumble and awoke from a long sleep. The villagers were frightened and ran, ran out of their houses and hid in the bushes at the foot of the mountain. A great wind came up, and the ancestor spirits in the trees cried out to warn them. Even the rocks began to tremble. Suddenly, the black night was split open like a coconut, and the great white burst of light rose like the sun. Then the voice of our mother Naka thundered out over all. Boom! Kaboom! Baboom! And the people cried out to Naka and prayed where they were lying down, hands pressing the earth, asking, What have we done to so anger you? All through the night, old Naka spoke to them, shouting her anger to the skies, as red rivers of lava flowed down their sides. The morning sun rose, but no one could see him. The anger of Naka was too great, and ashes and smoke filled the air. Finally, no one remembers when, Naka spoke no more. Slowly, carefully, the people lifted their heads and looked about. Everything was covered with ashes, even themselves. Everyone looked like a gray ghost. No one knew who stood next to them or who came behind. So they stood there, trembling with fear, but grateful to be alive. Naka had spared them. Still covered in ashes, the men, women, and children faced the mountain together and went back to claim their homes. But when they came to the burned-out village, only two houses were left standing, one square and one round. The people saw only that these two houses had been spared by Naka, and they wondered to themselves, 
Why these? Was it a sign? But the village chief had no time for such questions, and he called them together. We must begin to rebuild our village now. He pointed to the ash-covered people. You, tall gray things, you go live in the square house. And you, round gray things, go live in the round house. And you, small gray things over there, you go pick the small stones out of the fields so we can plant our crops again. And so it was done. The women lived in the round house with the children, and the women talked and laughed, preparing food for everyone. The men stayed in the square house and told each other tall tales and planted yams and corn each day in the new, rich soil. And the children made a game out of clearing the fields of small gray stones, went swimming and fishing in the long afternoons, and no one forgot to thank Naka for sparing their lives and giving them back such fine crops from her good earth. Grandma smiled down at me, and so you see it has been to this day, for the women have decided they enjoy getting together to talk and to laugh and to sing, and the men have become used to being together and relaxing in their own place. And the children? Osa, is it not true? The children still keep the fields clear of little gray stones? Yes, I laughed, and we swim and play in the afternoon, but we bring home the fish we catch for supper, and we all get together then. Grandma laughed too. So you see, Osa, we live together peacefully here because each one of us has a place to be apart and a time to be together. She took me by the hand and turned back to the round house, and that is how our way came about and will continue. Till Naka speaks again.